Computer's Tale today is in two parts. Part A is going to last about two minutes, and part B um, at more than an hour, I fear, but we'll see how we can go through it. Um, part one is passive computing. And basically, passive computing doesn't interest me at all, but it's mostly what we do. Um, it started with things like drafting back in the 80s. Um, Computer-aided design came off to a very shaky start um, with the notion that somehow computer drafting is what everyone wanted. And actually, um, it offered really particularly little advantage, just sort of automatic hatching and so on. Um, and, and finished, as far as I'm concerned, with the kind of building model I showed a couple of days ago, which is almost like the end of that line, where you've now got to the point where you can not just do drawings, but you can construct complete buildings from uh, fully worked out three-dimensional models, and they can drive computer equipment. And that process has taken, um, well, even from when it was first discussed, about 50 years, and when it first became sort of feasible with devices like this, which is the very end of the 70s, um, about uh, 25 years. Um, and what I'm very interested in is what the next 25 years or so are going to bring, because I think we're going to see a very rapid acceleration from this point. So we've now got to the point where you can drive computer manufacturing equipment to make the cladding and so on, to make the steel frames, to make all the doubler direct from those computer instructions. And yesterday we showed a little clip too of robotics assembly, which goes the whole way to actually building these things. And some of the first um, buildings to do this in anger, which, were, which couldn't have been done without those modeling things, are um, absurdly um, things like the Barcelona fish. Um, but, the, but the side effect of this is very interesting. Um, it, it only enabled Gary to successfully build and construct these complex geometries economically. But in so doing, it opened the door to the opportunity to, for other, uh, other buildings to use these same techniques for economy. And, and I discussed that at some length um, yesterday. Now this is the crucial slide. I used to go to a lot of conferences on computer-aided design in the early days, and I quite enjoyed them in the sort of early 80s. Um, but by the 90s, I was getting extremely bored of hearing the same thing again and again. And the ones I particularly hated were the ones on computer-aided design and in architectural education. Because you'd get some dumb lecturer would get up and explain that he had this wonderful idea about how you should teach students computing and how it was, how it was how, you know, almost like a, um, a kind of mission to do this. Um, and then they set them the most puerile exercises and complain the students didn't like doing them and saw this as somehow the student's fault. And I finally lost my temper at one of these and got up and said it was entirely their fault for setting them such dumb problems and I felt really sorry for any student having to suffer this nonsense. And I, I never went to any of those conferences again. But what I was really starting to do was to put this slide up at the end, just when everyone thought I'd finished. Because everyone took it for granted that computer-aided design was the answer to something, and perhaps it was. But the question was that the, the question hadn't come first. It wasn't as if most people were struggling with a problem with design for which they needed some more powerful tool for which the computer provided the answer. Now, there were exceptions, and I include myself in that, and I showed, and I won't show again this morning, but I have showed several times this week some of my own early um, explorations of projects when I was desperate for a powerful tool. And but my powerful tool wasn't um, a passive tool, and it wasn't a dumb drafting or rendering system. Um, so I think that we solved the wrong problem. And I remarked yesterday that the same thing I thought had happened in industrial building, where we solved the wrong problem by making these very expensive and difficult to make and difficult to move slabs in a factory, and then leaving on site to do what is the difficult bit, which is all to do with the joining up. Showing at these particular examples, this is the top of a vertical slab with the floor slab looking onto it, and the difficulty of adjusting and fitting this all together to tolerance on site. So instead of solving a problem, they'd actually made the problem worse. Now, I think exactly that same thing happened with computing, that we solved the wrong problem. 
actually most computer-aided design up until about the turn of this century were primarily concerned with actually doing the easy bit and making it more difficult. Um, this is known not as computer-aided design, but computer-obstructed design, or COD. And th that um, attitude, um, in a way, has, I think, in, in, in impeded the potential for developing other kinds of tools. So that's the first part of the lecture over. Um, now the second part, which is active computing, active, active tools. Now these are tools that hit back. Gordon Pass used to be good about this. You know, you just better not kick this. You used to go and kick something hard at the wall, and, 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 and if you just kick the wall and that's it, then it's just a passive wall. If you kick the wall and it kicks you back, then you've got an interactive system. And you should be talking in a, in a world where everything is, is is interactive all the time, and, and that's the environment we're moving into. And I'll say a little bit more about why as we go through this. And in those categories of advanced tools become things like evolutionary programs that never do the same thing twice. And I've talked about that before. Now, um, what I'm going to say today is I'm going to explain a little bit more detail about some of the tools in these toolboxes. Um, we've got four toolboxes that we're bringing to bear. And category one are generative techniques. Now, this covers all those techniques that do something for you, where you get some value for money. You, you get out more than you put in. And it seems to me that's fundamental rule one. If, you, if, the, if it takes more effort to put into the computer what you get out, then we're into a pretty dumb system. Now, I don't have time, obviously, this morning to talk about all of these. So what I'm going to do um, is touch um, very briefly on parametrics for about one minute, um, and then I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time um, talking about cellular automata, um, because it's, once, you've, once you've understood something like that, then it's not difficult to understand all the other possible techniques. I'm not saying that cellular automata is the only generative tech, or even the best one, it's just one that I enjoy using and is very easy to explain. I wanted to explain this parametric stadium design yesterday, but basically it's, it's the lowest level of active computing. Um, it's, very, it's the lowest level because instead of dis defining fixed geometry, you design, define variable geometry, which you can then play around with on a rule-based um, basis uh, to construct um, alternative forms very rapidly. And in this case, you can pull the stadium around, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of that slide, as if it was a piece of electronic putty, and all the calculations about all the sight lines of the 40,000 odd seats in the stadium follow automatically from it. So all the tedious work is being done for you, and it's continually checking for that. So as you, as you rearrange this stadium in real time, um, it does all the, all the detailing, as it were, for you. Now that's, that's the kind of minimum, I think that's the minimum threshold level for an active program. To, to at least take all that work out of you. And I showed you the Alpha Stadium just simply because I had to photograph the, the slides of this. This is a colleague of mine, Martin Rees. But this is interesting, not as a building particularly, but it's interesting because, except of course it's all made of glass, so, um, Farland was the engineer. Um, it's nice um, because, because they never drew anything. This is just rule, rule driven. And again, you can play around with this shape like a piece of electronic putty and all the detailing and all the things follow. And it's all just done by, by indicating the rules, which you can do quite simply in this piece of software down the side. And there are what I would call advanced, or the most and the more advanced computer systems, pretty well force you to design parametrically now. Nowadays. The aircraft industry cottoned onto this first because if they, they, if they possibly can, they always avoid designing a new component. And if they possibly can, they make a new component by making a small modification to another one. That applies to whole aeroplanes, like stretching Boeings. This is for all kinds of things. It's to do with economy. It's also to do with safety. If they know what Boeing a particular length flies, um, then it's easier for them to estimate the implications of a slightly longer one. I'm not holding that forward as a design ideal, I'm just making an observation about what happens. So this means that they put all the geometry into their systems in a parametric way and so that they can change it very easily. But I'm interested in something a bit more fundamental, which is driving the parametrics so that, that you don't even have to put in the variation manually. Um, 
that that automatically follows from the rule-based system. So cellular automata is, is version one of this. Um, let me just show you, um, most people are familiar with the life game, I'll just run a little demo in a minute. But it's a simple rule-based system where you have cells on a board and you have cells, sorry, there are cellular divisions on the board, the grid, and you have cells which are either alive or dead or about to be alive. Um, and cells, it, the clock ticks, and each tick, certain rules are applied. And I'll expand on this in a second. And the rules for this are very simple. If you've got too few neighbors, you die of loneliness. If you've got too many, you die of um, suffocation or overcrowding. If you've got just the right amount of neighbors, um, you carry on living. And if you've got the perfect number of neighbors, then you can conceive of a new child cell. Very simple rules. But it took John Horton Conway years to work those rules out because no one had ever done this before. John conceived of the very idea of uh, using a cellular automata in this way and uh, with hindsight it seemed trivially easy but before, it's, it's one of those classic things, before it, he'd finally got it to work it seemed that it might not work at all and he wasn't even quite sure what it was going to do and indeed was very surprised. Now, the reason that I know a lot about this, this the photograph I've been showing repeatedly all week and will not show again of the circular cathode ray tube at Cambridge University in 1970, um, there was only one other person using it at that time, and that's why there was only one of them. There wasn't much demand to buy a second, because there were only two of us, and we had to share it at night because it drained too much of the main computer power. And the only other person using it was John Horton Conway. So for four years, I was in the lab with him very well every night, um, and I was trying to develop my little seeding system I've been showing you, and he was trying to develop the life game. So I watched this thing develop from a day-to-day basis, and it had a very deep impact on me. So this is, for example, one of the things that surprised John. He didn't, it didn't surprise him in the sense that he expected behaviors to emerge, but this particular one is surprising. The particular configuration in generation one goes through a series of generations as the clock ticks, and finishes up in generation five with the same shape but moved. So this thing moves across the screen. And um, there are then the notion of something called a that's called a glider. All these things in the in the um, kind of uh, folk mythology of the life game. You'll find if you're interested in hundreds of websites dedicated to the life game. And, and one of the things was a, was to try and design a glider gun. The thing on the left is a gun that generates gliders continuously, which then fire off and hit other things and so on. Um, let me just do a random first demo. You, you have to see the system. The rules in this one are fixed. Now, interesting things happen if you change the rules. And I'll show it first of all in the slow motion. And at each clock, tick of the clock, um, the rule is applied, which means some cells will die. Some will continue to live and some will have to. Some will become stuck already, you can see. This is stuck forever. This has become what's known as a blinker, will go on blinking forever. This thing, though, is continually growing and is crashing into the rest and may, in due course, come and upset these other, other uh, parts. Now, um, what I will not show now, but is fascinating, is when you, when you run these with very, very large arrays and you run them very, very fast, because then instead of this jerky movement, even if I just speed this one up, um, you will find that the um, effect of seeing them very fast, of course, is it flows. Let me just go back to slow and go to um, the shoot some demonstrations on here, like the guy. So here is the glider in operation. Five steps and it repeats, but it's moved. So there's an argument about whether this represents a very simple form of emergent behavior. In one sense, it does, because it wasn't entirely expected. And it's a behavior um, which you could say is unexpected from the rules. However, the rules are strictly deterministic. So what you're talking about is chaotic system or an emergent system within um, a deterministic structure. Um, and this is an interesting category, all of its own, of phenomena, um, but is in fact um, 
known in other examples. Um, but it's certainly surprising. But you can describe that as emergent. Let me just pick another couple. So you get the general idea. And um, now, some people have gone to some trouble to analyze this. Um, Stephen Wolfram, who must be one of the most arrogant people on the planet, thinks he's invented a new form of science with this. We're all a bit puzzled by this, since most of what he's written about was already in print from other people, but never mind. Um, he did actually carry out a fairly ruthless analysis of these different systems. And um, this is the simplest possible automata. This is a one-line automata. And all that happens is that this cell changes in relationship to its neighbors. And it only has two neighbors, so there are only eight possible rules, making only 256 combinations possible of those rules. However, it's written down here with time on this axis. It looks 2D. It's not 2D like the life game you've just seen, where you saw time as an animated aspect of it. Here, the time axis is going down the page. So this particular set of rules will always generate a checkerboard. Um, this small change to the rules, you have to blink to notice, but down here there's a small change, produces what you might call a sort of sparse checkerboard. Then there are other characteristics. These are quite interesting. They have certain patterns that, 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 that run through it, but nevertheless it never quite repeats. So there are, there are four categories of these. Category one is those that get die or get stuck. Category two is those that um, go into a permanently chaotic state and so on. And so when you look at large numbers of these, uh, you get obviously a, a kind of overall, they all, all this particular group look like this sort of rain pattern. However, exactly what it's like it depends on the specific rule. It also depends on where it's starting from. In these examples, it's just got one seed at the top. And I'll show what happens when we add more seeds in a moment. But first, let's just establish some rules. Um, these are the characteristics of cellular automata. First of all, rule one is parallelism, that all the updates are independent and they're all done at the same time. The clock ticks and the, the same rule applies to all of them, and it's done simultaneously, independently. Um, and locality, that it depends entirely on its adjacent neighbors. And rule three is it's homogeneous, that they all, uh, each cell is updated with the same rules. And rule four is that they all have the same neighborhood, say typically eight cells around a square. And that it's sensitive to the initial starting conditions, the seed. So those are the rules. And that controls it. However, you can break them all. Um, and when you start breaking them, things get more interesting still. Parallelism, you don't have to do it all at the same time. It can grow outwards, the changing from one end. It can start from one end of the system. You can have some cells which are prioritized in time. Locality, you could have variable neighborhoods. It could be more than eight cells. The neighborhood variation doesn't have to be homogeneous. You don't even have to have the same rules through a system. The neighborhood can change. And the starting conditions um, can, can change dynamically and retrospectively. So you can break all those rules. But if you ever want to play with these systems, I just suggest you start with them first, as they are, before you try to get too ambitious. Because if you break all those rules, you don't know what's happening. So you don't know whether you made a mistake in the programming and so on. However, I would like to say that in order to get really interesting applications of these, um, you have to break the rules. Now this causes a big problem because we've got purists, and we'll come across purists a number of times today. Purists are those people who think that you should stick to the rules and get very upset when you don't and tell you you've made a mistake. Um, there's a quite well-known um, person, a professor at University College London who takes that view, who uses cellular automata, um, who thinks that anything that doesn't follow these fundamental rules can't be called a cellular automata. Um, I think everything he's done is extremely dull. He thinks everything I've done is cheating. Well, we are. Um, this is a sensitivity to initial starting conditions. Um, this is um, applying those same rules, but this time to a random seed of more than one. This is Wolfram again, and the same rules that I've just shown you. So this time it takes a little bit longer for these ones to die out. And here you see different rules being applied to 
um, the same different starting conditions to see what will happen. Um, <laughs> now, of course, you get whole sheets of stuff which are sensitive to their initial starting conditions. So something like this is quite interesting because it, 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 there are two things. One is a small change in a rule will make a great deal of difference to the pattern. But also, when you get these very characteristic shapes running through it and these kind of dribble lines, they, are, they have emerged from that initial starting condition. But as you can see, you've gone quite a few iterations before um, some kind of um, a more overall pattern arises. Now this raises a very interesting theoretical question, which is how do you know if you've got a totally chaotic system? What would happen if you just took a very much bigger view of it? Maybe it would appear very ordered. What would happen if you took a very, very long time span um, of something? And I want to return to that very point at, at the very end of the lecture, because in many ways it's crucial. Um, and maybe if you change your vision and vantage point, you do get a very different picture. And as I said, doing these things on a very large scale and very speeded up um, does give a quite different picture of, of the, the dynamic interactions. This is the first slides I've got of anyone trying to use one of these techniques. This is from Paul Coates, who runs the master's course at the University of East London. Paul was one of the first architects that I know who got interested in using cellar automata. And this is some simple housing layouts he did at a very early stage. It's a simple cellular automata system. There are three kinds of things going on. You can have more than just live and dead states, obviously. There's a, a live or dead state, which is a house in this case. The house has an entry condition, which is that little tiny line sticking out from it into the next cell. And then they have gardens, which is the speculty bit. And then you have, you have nothing in space. It's very, very simple. And it's very, very early. And it just goes through. Um, the development of these housing layouts. But what's quite interesting about this, apart from the fact it was so very early and Paul was very early to catch on to this, is the fact that it actually produces quite interesting variety. And everybody who didn't know about them but was hearing about it, their immediate assumption that some kind of rule-based computer system like this would produce endless monotony was very quickly proved wrong within, within the first few hours, in fact, of Paul getting this to work, um, because these things produce considerable variety and very, very small changes in the rules and starting conditions produce really quite interesting layouts of plan. And so he experimented with rules that would produce something that looked like a plausible parody of the very stuff we were seeing in AD at the time, winning housing awards in London. You can think of chance of the state I'm talking about. But he managed to generate pretty well exactly the plan of that, but only but it had come from rule-based things. So this is quite interesting and promising early start. These, of course, can be, this is a student like Ian Chi, who, who wrapped it around a torus. And he was a musician. And so here we have several different things. One, the shape is not flat. This is, this is a torus, a donut. Secondly, that you've got more than one state, alive and dead. Now you've got different colors. And the different colors represented different sounds. So this thing made um, a kind of a dot and played and invented tunes which were quite surprisingly melodic. And they had endings because the whole system would crash into itself because of course these things could travel around the donut. So it tended to kind of build up to some kind of, uh, some kind of climactic point in the composition and then often would die away and, 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 and end either blinking or it would, go, or it would die out completely. So they're, they're, we're not constrained to, to flat planes, we're not constrained to, to visual things, they can be sound, they can be in color and so on. This is Weave. Um, this is a student of mine called Barbara Das Alster, who did a PhD on Weave. Now Weave is a cellar automata. You can see that as a rule-based system, and that's how that's been generated. And there were two or three things that she investigated, um, one of which was the notion of generating weaves from the cell automata rules. And the other thing was the idea of introducing errors into the system. I don't have an error slide here, I'm afraid. But what the, what the idea was that you would introduce a deliberate mistake somewhere down the weave, and then it would start to generate a new pattern, as, as you've just seen with the Wolfram thing flowing through it. And, and these are quite surprising, because weave, weavers turn out to be both quite con, um, conservative in general, and they tend to think that they've seen all possible weaves. Um, 
The thing that's interesting with Barbara's case is that these were ex exhibited by the Crafts Council in, in, in London, and people were very shocked. They actually found some of these weaves shocking because they hadn't seen them before. And that was quite interesting. And the other thing about this is the weaving machines are controlled, this is a jacquard loom, and those punch holes enable you to vary the loom under computer control. And so again, there is an immediate link between the, uh, the mechanics of the process, the concept running underneath it, and the design intent. And furthermore, and Babbage, who uh, was developed the, the, the famous difference engine, which is in the Science Museum, when he saw the Jacquard loom, he realized what he'd just seen was a variable, a reprogrammable computer. And, and he more or less stopped work on the difference engine because the difference engine could only provide one form of calculation. He said, if I controlled my, all my gear wheels with something like the Jacquard mechanism, then I would have a variable, um, a reprogrammable computer. And this is very interesting because he's not, although Babbage is highly regarded, he's not really known and for having made this extraordinary statement and prefigured computing, even pre turing Those are all 2D so far, or round toruses. This is 3D, um, group of students at the AA in 1989 and built this. Each cell is self-evidently um, a computer in space. It has eight light-emitting diodes on it, which therefore allow it to have 256 possible different states and those different states control the, the, the transition, the transition rules from one state to another. Um, so we've got a, 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 a rule-based system which is in a, a rigorous 3D grid and is controlled um, uh, by rigorous transition rules. However, the very fact that it's got so many states possible for each spell, that's 256 instead of, let's say, the three of a live, dead, or about to be born, let's allow us three states for that. And 256 gives you a great deal more power um, to produce variations. And this is it running, it's slowed down so you can see the logic flowing up and down these towers. And this is both an input and an output device. You can make an input device by arranging and configuring it um, to make a particular environment as a problem to the computer. And you can um, um, also use it as an output device because the computer can solicit your interaction by flashing red lights. It's a traditional, all throughout the world, of displaying a red light when you want to solicit interaction. And so we used just exactly that principle. One flash in light meant, please take me away. And two meant, please add another one on top. We could, of course, have controlled a robotic arm. But you'll see repeatedly, I'm interested in trying to solicit human interaction in these systems. So we've avoided that kind of temptation. This is Stefan Simula. Now this sequence came just from one arrangement of those cubes. It was in an exhibition in 1990, and he took one of the arrangements of the cubes in that exhibition and used the 256 states then to map it. Again, in this case, I have to say three things. One, it was out of control, totally. And two, we all rather liked that because we were totally surprised. This kite-like thing, there, there, he's got some 5,000 slides from this sequence that took him a year to do. And when you see them very close together in the sequence, these things appear to move on the screen like with kites and birds. And, and none of us expected that, so that was quite delightful. And the third thing was he had to cheat. Um, he discovered that 256 transition rules wasn't enough. So at some point in the middle of that process, he multiplied it by a random number to increase this to 4,096 variants. Um, I thought that was delightful too, but in future models we did make more states, 256 we had thought would be plenty. Um, and the next one I'm going to show, we put it up to 16 million to cover ourselves. Um, and in fact, in one of the models, it's more than that. Um, so that the, the, the cheating was only temporary. Anyway, as you discovered, I think cheating in order to try to push the idea forward is fine by me. Um, and other people attached it to something different. Pete Silver um, used those same numbers not to make um, programming changes, but to drive stepper motors, to drive 3D splines. The idea had been to have a whole network of these motors making a complex 3D surface. But as it turned out, we could only afford four motors. So you have to imagine this is an actual 3D grid of these motors. Um, but the principle was clear, that you can use those same instructions can become the different students' positions in dance, they can become music, they can become 
uh, unfolding shapes. They can drive pieces of, 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 of electronic uh, mechanical equipment from that same set of instructions. And this is an important um, sequence for me because, of course, um, there is there tends to be an assumption that the cubes are cubes, and as I hope I just shown, the cubes aren't cubes at all. They're actually birds or flights or movement or wind or dogs. And that's to do with the with the abstraction of the mapping. Right now, in this bottom left-hand corner is what we call literal mapping. There is a little. This is a device that reads Chinese characters. And the Chinese characters are just simply the Chinese character that they say they are. There is no mapping going on at all, so we call that literal. Of course, you can write it on the screen differently. You could write a translation. One of these is a dragon. I can't see them well enough from here. Um, so you could actually write either the Chinese for it, or of course you could write dragon in translation on the, in the, on the screen. We had in mind the idea of children's building bricks with letters on, helping them learn to read and learn other languages and so on. Then there's representational mapping. I've shown several times this slide of Walter Siegel system, where the panels in the model represent um, panels in the building, not terribly literally, but sufficiently little doors and windows are illustrated iconically. And then the third level is semantic. That's the frame of that building. Now, the frame isn't in the middle at all, but the frame has been deduced by the software. So we call that semantic mapping, where something a deduction occurred. At this level, there's slightly more symbolic mapping. It's not quite as literal as this one, because now the colors represent different forms of building construction. An orange panel is different to red, so it becomes a what-if model for exploring alternative designs for different solar performance and so on. By the time we got to the cubes, we were talking about very abstract mapping. The group of students that did this, and again, it's the, the same technique I use, is to get the whole group of students to collaborate to build one thing that held them all together, and then get the group to each, each student individually to do something with it that was different, thereby producing more variety and individual projects, except held together by a consistent central um, model of some kind, which gave, I hope, group coherence and, and more total impact. And, the, the other example that I, I have mentioned and will show again is Groningen. And the students, of course, debated at the beginning whether or not to make these more representational. There are early drawings where they thought they ought to make these actually be things like a kit of parts. But luckily, I'm pleased to say, this is the first time they've done this, they talked themselves into um, making them all identical and then using the software to show that they're not identical at all. So a cube can be a sphere or you can be red, or you can be a dog, or wind, or a dance, or whatever. And finally, we've got evolved mapping, where you don't just map directly uh, in one step, but you have to go through a sequence of instructions, where, in, in fact, you're, it, you're really driving the program, the software, um, to do the evolution from that set of instructions. And, and that's pretty well the most abstract level that we've got to yet. But possibly not quite. Um, I was asked a question, I think, by Mark the other day about that. And I thought afterwards, well, actually, we've already got some that do programming instruction, so I'll show that in a moment. Um, this is from Lionel March's book, um, which is quite interesting. It's showing how economical that packing can be. Um, he wrote EF803, this is hexadecimal, that means counting to the base 16 goes into binary, binary goes into the grid, that gets you uh, Le Corbusier's Maison Minimum. And I was going to, and I forgot, being Christmas, it was going to be a Christmas quiz, I was going to show the number at the top of that, which I can't cover up, and ask you which well-known building it is. However, you wouldn't have had the hope of guessing, so there was no point. But anyway, it's just to show how the density of this kind of coding works, and the, and the way in which this mapping, mapping can be done. And Lionel, um, had looked at this as a theoretical idea long before he got any, any particular idea about how to apply it, which is quite interesting. Uh, here's a very um, literal explanation of that. So there is a cube, and using the eight lights, that one is 239. So that's a Doric column, sorry, capital. Now then we have a fluted column, 238. 237 is a base, stack them up, and you get a column on the base with a capital. Um, put one next to a multiplier, you get four of them. Um, change the capital, and you get a row of ionic capital columns. Trivial. That's literal mapping, um, um, but it's obviously the cube isn't a cube, but it's, it's something static, uh, and it can be anything you want. 
so they make a row of ionic columns. Um, so that's the basic principles of that, and I'll develop that in a moment. But first I have to do with toolbox number two, which evolutionary techniques. I remarked a moment ago that that sequence by Stefan Simbola was out of control. And one of the things we wanted to do was to control that evolution. And um, one of the first people to demonstrate this was Richard Dawkins. His biomorphs made an enormous impact worldwide for all kinds of reasons in his book, The Blind Watchmaker. And he wrote a little bit of Apple software that, that allows you to play with it, where you get a gene, uh, a chromosome or genes, and you uh, can manipulate these to change little insects. And then you can select on the screen, I'm going to choose this one and this one and crossbreed them. And so you can go through endless generations seeing how they would evolve. Or you can go in and actually meddle with the gene directly and do some genetic engineering. And this is a very dramatic, very simple um, little Apple map, um, application. Round about, I meant to check the date, but I think about, 19, about 1980. Early Mac days. 18, something like that, quite early on. And it was very nice and was a worldwide hit like the life game. So it made little trees, little insects and so on. Now, the theoretical um, exposition of this was going on quite separately. That was Richard Dawkins really popularizing it. The, the theory really comes from someone called John Holland, um, who uh, developed this theory of optimization in engineering. And when we started looking at this um, and said we were going to use it for design problems, everyone said it wouldn't work for the two reasons at the bottom. That design problems have ill -defined, are ill-defined problems and we have conflicting criteria. Now my response to this was, well hang on a minute, genetic algorithms are based on an analogy with nature. Um, nature managed to generate you would you describe yourself as a clearly defined problem? Would you identify any non-conflicting criteria? And it said, I said, well, look, nature's just nothing but ill-defined problems and conflicting criteria. And nature managed to cope. Well, you know, what's wrong with your algorithm? It's not, you know, it's not the problem that's at fault. You know, I'm going to leave architect. Because I think one of the problems in the 60s, when the whole notion of design methodology and rationalization first started to emerge in design science, was that people wanted to define the problems and wanted to have clear methodologies. There was a particular kind of mindset that needed this psychologically. And Chris Jones, who at one time had written the most famous design methods manual, but, but was himself actually critical of that attitude, finally came out and said, well, you know, most of my colleagues who have this are interested, have this problem that they want the problems to be clearly defined, and unfortunately they're in the wrong business. If that's what you want, then you shouldn't have anything to do with design, because it's never going to be so, so clearly defined and so on. So this has been a, a, a kind of underlying battle here. Again, it's back to the, to the those who don't want to break the rules. Um, that's the name of the book. It's a very nice title, Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. Right from the start, Holland saw um, a direct parallel. So here are some examples from a, another book where it just shows the, the, the principle of a genetic algorithm. You take a, a, a basic form and you subject it to a um, mutation in the software. And the mutation is then evaluated to see whether it would, um, in this case, produce less drag by using a technique called computational fluid dynamics, um, which gives you a better idea of its, of its um, performance. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is that every 600 generations, which is quite few, we often know not, not more than that, it's produced quite an unexpected shape, which is expected to be able to perform better. So the outcome of this was, um, was, was better and, and unexpected. There's another example that came from machine reading, this one, which is um, a hosepipe nozzle. The hosepipe nozzle was designed into little segments, and then, um, each one could vary at random, and then after, after um, many generations, to see uh, what improved flow you might get. And at my generation 45, this is a considerable improvement, produces again, um, at first sight, a counterintuitive and rather unexpected nozzle. Now, the reason this works is, is of course, that post-rationalization can be explained, which is that these little chambers start to absorb some of the 
um, as, as, the, as the nozzle gets constricted, the flow, you get turbulence due to the boundary condition of friction. And these little sub-chambers, which actually occur, this is obviously simplified on this diagram, produce little, little areas which absorb the turbulence, leaving space through the middle for the, for the clear flow of the water. So there's a perfectly logical explanation with hindsight, but it hadn't occurred to any engineer beforehand to try that kind of approach. So this is the way these things are being used. There's an odd more example from structures. Again, in my day, we used to have to do little structural calculations. Maybe you don't need to anymore. But in this case, the idea was to minimize the weight of this truss. There are, there's the given conditions of some loading, and you have to produce the, the lightest possible weight. You make something in the studio with straws and see if it can support a brick kind of thing, and the lightest one wins. Well, this is quite interesting because you can see the graph here. It plateaued after it made it, for a while it was stuck. Then it made it a little bit of a leap through, and then it you know, patterned out. However, just when everyone thought it had finished, it suddenly went to failure. It flipped at stage six. A lot of people have given up trying to use them because, and it's their fault. It's, they just haven't got the imagination to see how to, to define a problem in a loose enough way so it can do step six. So I don't think that's creativity on the, on the computer's part. I think if you only get to stage five, that's a lack of creativity on the part of the person that programmed it. Anyhow, these all work the same way. You have a pool of genes, a population, they go into some kind of environment where they develop. Some of these are selected as a result of their success, and they then cross over and crossbreed to make the next generation. So here you see crossover and mutation. This is equivalent of sexual reproduction, and mutation is very small random um, copying errors, um, which also stop the um, things getting in a rut and, and lead to some of these new developments as indeed happens in our own evolution. Here's an example, a very early experiment trying to breed a column. Screen resolution at this date was so bad that we used to plot them out with big sheets of paper. And overnight it was so slow that we'd come and wallpaper the wall in the morning with hundreds of columns and then go around and pick, oh well let's try breeding that one with that one, that one with that one, and, and then send it back into the machine. As a result of that it bred finally on the right there, pretty well perfect James Gibbs column. Um, and uh, um, what we've done uh, is we've taken James Gibbs's, he wrote in 1745, this very elegant book called on how to draw columns with very simple rules. And all the books before that had very complicated ratios. And he had this book that simply said, you know, take the order upon a height and make the column one eighth of the diameter of the thing and so on. And he had all these rules. So what we did, we took all these rules, except they stuck a random number generator on each one. So where he got so eight to one or four to one, or all these beautifully worked out ratios, we just multiplied it by a random number and messed the whole thing up again. And having messed it up, so it produced all these weird columns, we then got the software unmess it again. So this is a totally pointless exercise. All we were trying to do is to prove that this could be done. Uh, also, of course, you, can't, you, you, you can choose to pick, you don't have to pick the ones that look like James, you can pick ones that look shorter and fatter if you have a predilection for shorter, fatter columns and so on. This is applying it to yacht design. Um, this is done in AutoCAD, and there's a cute little program called Auto Yacht, which allows you to do calculations. This programming was done by another student of mine called Peter Graham, and he um, uh, programmed it so that it did mutations on the shape of the yacht. And from those mutations, um, then did calculations on the wetted area, the block coefficient, which basically how blunt it is, the water line length, from which you could decide which yacht was probably going to be faster, and as a result, um, you could optimize the development the design. However, there are conflicting criteria, lovely. Um, the outside, the pressures of trying to make this boat go faster, would tend to force that hull to be narrower and narrower and longer and longer. That's for some of the displacement sailing. And if there's anybody in the audience who does sail, they'll we'll also know that there are other kinds of things like planing and half planing, for which you want the back end flatter, um, which is another interesting conflict right from the start. But I'm not going to talk about all the conflicts, just a very obvious one, which is that outside is trying to get longer and thinner and more streamlined, and the inside, the designer is trying to force it wider and fatter so they can have a more spacious and usable area. And the people on the deck want more space to move about with their winches and get the sails well outboard and so on. So there's a whole pile of conflicting criteria. The question is how do you resolve them? Because otherwise the algorithm is just going to make the thing longer and longer and longer and thinner and thinner and thinner. Now Darwin had the answer, of course. 
Darwin had the problem of trying to explain evolution. And in chapter one, he talked about variation under domestication. He said, well, you all breed pigeons, all know about breeding pigeons and dogs and racehorses and so on. And when you pick two racehorses to breed, you're using artificial selection. And um, you're, you're choosing using your skill and judgment to, to crossbreed two things which will make a stronger horse or a faster horse or a better stale or whatever. And you know all about that, that's artificial selection. And then he said in chapter two, the bombshell, natural selection works the same way. However, it does it over a very long time scale with very, very large numbers of iterations. And they're uh, given a small possible advantage due to some very small genetic alteration. Eventually, and, and by cross-breeding these, you will eventually um, favor those that have some particular advantage and gradually they will start to dominate the gene pool. And of course it's more complicated because there is um, co-evolution of two different species, the prey and the predator, one running faster to get away from the other, the other having to fly faster and so on. So we had this very complex process that Darwin had to try and sell. Now what we said, well we should do just the same thing. Um, this is possibly the most important slide of, of, of all I can show. Natural selection is equivalent to doing the calculations. Artificial selection is equivalent to the racehorse breeder, or be just pointing to the columns. Convergent evolution is obviously converging on a solution. So when you look at the trying to design a better turbine blade or structure, you're only in this quadrant. We're just using the computer software to, to select um, something to converge on an optimal solution. Now, there are three other possible quadrants, and this is where the excitement comes, because if you go into this quadrant, you can pick yourself, using your skill and judgment and intuition, anything else, to make decisions about conflicting criteria. So you can choose off the screen the ones you want to breed. And also, if you're trying to get into a rut, you can turn up the divergent evolution and generate many more random variants. This is what you want to do when you want to impress visitors. You turn up the random number generator, and it makes wildly different proposals in a few seconds, but usually quite useless. The problem is finding the good one. Okay, I can generate five million random useless variations on the theme quickly enough. Well, how am I going to find them? Is that a million monkeys typing Shakespeare? Fair enough, but who's going to find Hamlet in that lot? You know, who's going to read all the, all the near misses? No mind the complete. So the point is how to find them. And so really you use a combination of these techniques. So typically, overnight, you run it in convergent mode using natural selection where the computer can pick itself the ones that are going to be most efficient and show you those in the morning. And then you use what you're good at, which is your skill and judgment, to then make hand selections and so on. And from that balance, you can, you can get this balance, which I showed with Ron Holland, between the skill and judgment of the designer and the power of the computer not using the power of the computer, again, as I was saying right at the beginning, in the mindless way to solve the wrong problem. We've tended to use computers to, to, to solve the very, or try to solve the very problems we're best at anyway, and not left them to do the things they're actually, actually good at. Um, this is combined cellular automata and uh, genetic algorithms, first done by Chiro, where these are, you can see those are cellular automata-like things, little cubes, only this time the rules for combining, instead of being fixed, are themselves controlled by a genetic algorithm. So the rules, the transition rules, can change. That's like changing the DNA. So each time you run it, it runs differently. So these shapes that are coming out are each time going to be different, and they're going to be based on feedback about the success of the runs before. These are not proposals for buildings, I have to keep saying this. They are visualizations of uh, shape data. And this is an uh, input of um, solar movement in this case, which is one of the constraints that's being used on some hypothetical object in the middle here. And this shows the kind of change of those parameters as the algorithm explores them. That was taken up a year or so later by this project I showed you before. I'm going to show this again, but so now I can explain it a little bit further. This is a 3D solar automata. It's using a uh, set of transition rules in that single cell. You start as a single cell, this starts as a single cell, this is seeded with a single cell, but those rules are causing cellular division to occur 
in a response to some kind of environment. This is, at this point, a lot more complicated. That this had the provision for 16 million states in each of these cells. It wasn't using all of them. But that was from our previous experience of the 256 not being enough. Also, we had access to more computing power at that point. The important thing that I'm going to explain in a moment is that the rules that are making this thing happen are themselves dynamically coded so that they can change like the DNA from run to run. So every time you run this, it's going to produce something different. When it starts out, every cell is identical, and then, as I showed you the other day, it reaches a point of stasis, and the cells start to specialize. In this case, the specialization is made manifest by a change in color and a change in geometry, around about now, I hope. Uh, anyway, now it's changing its cellular specialization, so that the cells are no longer cubes, but are purple rods. Some of these are flattening, some are turning into sheets. But in this particular run, they're still all flat and fairly cubic in proportion. So I'll stop that because that's just one run. These ones are other runs of the same software. It's still plank-like there, but the plank planking part of it and the foot surfaces is much more marked. And by this run, these are starting to curve. You can see that these shapes now are starting to bend. So that the constraints on this are, are causing uh, the, the, the transition rules got to a state where they're causing the software to uh, make manifest changes to the actual output form. Um, and that, as I've shown before, that the exhibition became more complex. Um, that just remind me to tell you that the book's available free online. Um, the exhibition we did in 95, we ran that cellular automata um, and used that to drive some of the exhibition. But in the middle was this device which uses census and environment, visitors, virtual and actual, and that's what was evolved. That's the sensor, that's the web page interaction. These are the cycles. Now, now I just pause on this. The other bits I've shown before, I haven't really explained this diagram. These are the um, extreme complexity of these cycles. The cell, there's a cellular growth cycle here. Uh, there's a, the chromosomal algorithm, which has a gene pool, and various ways in which that uh, information is cycled and developed. Um, and at the end, there's a materialization that turns that into stuff. You, know, you can say that we can only see us because this is the residual dross of the cellular activity going on in our body. We're just the, the, the only bit you can ever see are the, are the tree. All you can see is the, is the, is the dross left over from the cellular activity. Um, the real cells are going about their business inside here. Um, and so that's what happens here. And these, this, is, this is a very complex piece of software. So that on the right-hand side is the cell splitting, on the left-hand side is the materialization. I just touched this morning on neural networks for a moment and chemical construction. Um, neural, uh, neural networks are uh, attempts to build computers which are more representative of the kind of way our brains work. Um, this little laptop in front of me is a serial computer. Um, it does one thing, instruction after another. Things go in, goes through a series of algorithms, comes out. There's more than one processor working in parallel because there's one controlling the screen, one looking after the keyboard, one doing communications and so on. But essentially they're in parallel, but they don't make really very much advantage of that. You know, all the stuff in the printer goes across at one moment and so on. And whereas in your brain, there are thousands of connections into each synapse, which learns whether to fire or not on the basis of its previous experience. So these are attempts to build models of, or working models of computers that um, simulating that process. And I, I mentioned several times before about the possible development of computers over the next 25 years. My own view on this is that, that we, the progress on the last 25 years is minute compared with the rate of progress. I think we're going to have a, a, an exponential growth. 
and certainly a linear but possibly exponential growth of computing power and speed still. So the question you ask everybody is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with all this computing power? What problem is it going to solve? The other problem is, as it gets smaller, where are you going to put it? It's a terrible worry that you might you know, snort your computer accidentally at breakfast. Um, <coughs> but the other interesting thing is the development of biological computers, and um, particularly neural network type things. This particular student, being an architectural student, thought for some reason that if he made, instead of laying it all out on a printed circuit board, if he messed it all up in a box like this, somehow it would look more like a brain. Um, I won't comment on that, but what was sure it made it very difficult for him to find all the mistakes in the wiring. <laughs> so, uh, it never worked properly, but it worked well enough to, to make a demonstration. And this is chemical computing. This is a technique developed by Gordon Pask. So that's, that's the simulation of biological computing. This is chemical computing. This, this is a crystal growth. Um, this, this model is broken at this point. But basically, you have various electrodes around the tank, and depending on um, where the current's flowing, it will increase the probability of crystals growing in that direction, and that will increase the chances of it switching that way in the future. This is somewhere halfway between a kind of biological model and a, and a, a binary switching computer. And again, I think there's going to be an enormous development in, in, in these chemical um, chemical type processes. So there's a whole whole sets of, of, of likely computers coming available soon, and that they all will allow us to work in ways which I think is much more natural. Um, so a lot of the actual physical limitations, not to mention the absurdity of the keyboard. And we finally appear to adopt a tool box for interaction. Um, this is one of many experiments which was to do with trying to look at other, data, other input devices other than keyboards and mice and so on. Um, mice. You know, it doesn't look like a mouse at all. It's actually styled like a secretary's kneecap, so that the managing director can still keep control in the traditional way. And it's um, the ergonomics of it. Just think about this little keyboard and that little, little device I've got here. Interesting. Anyway, everybody has their choice of whether they like little balls to fiddle with or kneecaps or whatever. Anyway, um, the the idea was to try to try to investigate things that were more natural. So in this case, looking at the possible interaction of physical models with the first one we built um, was in 1979, which was in fact a cellular automata, but it's an intelligent cellular automata. This pre preceded the one I showed you ago by some 10 years. And it's just intelligent enough to know how to organize itself. So this actually is a self-replicating device. Um, this is actually quite scary as a proposition, because it means that you can build devices that are clever enough to know how to go on building themselves. And I talked a little bit about Neil Gershenfeld's work on this um, earlier in the week. Um, each cell is semi-autonomous because um, it still takes power from somewhere else. Later on, Manet and uh, Thomas Pujano built this one, which is autonomous. This is quite neat. Um, on each edge, it has input and output um, uh, infrared transmitters. And each cell has on board its own battery and power supply. And they're synchronized by this. This is a light-sensitive um, cell. And you flash a camera, flash gun, and the flash gun is picked up by the, all these things lying around on the floor and they're then synchronized. So then, like fireflies, they synchronize all their signals and start to arrange themselves because they use, again, these lights on top here to indicate where they want to be. But they're communicating with each other via these infrared connections. So these cells all over the floor are all talking to each other about how to arrange themselves autonomously. Um, early other ones were intelligent beer mats. The, uh, idea that you can use these in the pub to design things, but it, it remembers the idea at the end of the evening. By the, you, know, you know the thing, here's the, here's the living room, here's the, you know, but then of course you can't remember the following morning. In this case, you just take the tape off the edge and give it off to the computer to dry. Um, and a beer mat, as I repeatedly pointed out, a Guinness mat is exactly the same with the standard circuit board, so it can't be a coincidence. Um, early, early interactive models. And the 3D one, I'm showing that one because of the question that arose about why make the other things stackable only. Um, basically, these are just a damn nuisance having all these sideways connectors. They're very difficult to unplug and plug together, and they make increase the complexity for no real great advantage. Now, one of my colleagues has just rebuilt one of these 3D ones very elegantly, and of course, I forgot to bring a slide. I'll try and remember tomorrow to actually bring it in physically if we can. I'll bring it in. You can play with it. Um, but, so it's possible. 
to make 3D structures in space that are like trees and don't have a baseboard and so on. But it doesn't really have any actual advantage. It's just quite nice to, to play with. And then we made more flexible prototypes which enabled you to have different kinds of shapes. A plotter behind is doing a self-portrait of this thing. It had mercury switches in so you can turn it up on its edge and it had lots of different sockets. The idea was that these are just arbitrary shapes, merely to show they didn't have to be cubes because they still had this problem that people thought that these were cubes. Um, and of course you could put them inside any other part of any other kind of model so that when you showed the client, your client your, um, your, your model, it was interactive. You could change the arrangement of the, the hospital plan or whatever. For magnetic cladding, the magnetic cladding allowed you to change the fenestration and the fenestration then went through one of these semantic mapping programs so you could do the sunlight penetration. That was really just to demonstrate how something you can touch and move would quickly go through to something else that could do an analysis on it. Um, this is quite an important point conceptually that the model isn't what it is, is more than what it appears to be. That is, it's it linked through to the computer. It's smart enough to tell you all kinds of things about its behavior. So no more dumb models. Um, but as you discovered, I actually really love physical models, and um, we've seen that repeatedly from the bull bearing. They keep on coming back and they won't go away because I think there's an awful lot to do. And I love this Frank Gehry thing about fast car. This, by the way, David, is your um, physiotherapy appointment car. Anyway, we'll do very nicely to simulate a Gehry building. And um, uh, the, 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 the Frank calls it fast car. Yeah. And your fucking computer going to do it faster than I can do this. Anyway, let's go. Periodically, these things got repainted. It's also been built with better electronics, but nothing's changed, you see. T t ten year, 20 years later, it's now possible to build with one single chip in there. But what amused me about this was the technician doing this finished up with all these ribbon cables. It finished up just about as much wire as the thing in the first place. So, no real progress. Little, um, these blocks are smaller than Lego blocks, and each one has a possible 256 different states yet again, which means you can have 256 different colors of Lego, um, or different shapes, so you can build elaborate models and um, the software can analyze it. And of course, I've said before, and I won't explain again, you, this was applied for the project with Walter Siegel to make self built to self designers, and applied to Cedric Price to get the generator um, intelligent enough to be able to organize itself. But it's all based on that same principle of embedding electronics in some way into physical things with which you can interact conveniently. And of course, that same mapping diagram applies right through that linearity. Um, other people in the world like these, they keep, they keep turning up. This guy, the two people here are interesting. This is, this is Yoshifumi in the middle there. And Yoshifumi in Japan, recently, as recent as, as 2000, made this, which is two more of these cubes. Then he found out that we'd already got some of these, so he came to see me. So then he's holding my system, and I'm dutifully holding his. And this is Brig Ulmer from MIT Media Lab, where he and Hiroshi Ishii had also done the same thing again. So this thing keeps on coming up. Now, when that happens, and spontaneously and differently, different people around the world get involved in the same preoccupation, it leads me always to have some confidence that there's something deeply troubling, that people really do are struggling to find some other solution to these kinds of um, interactive problems. Um, and that's Hiroshi Ishii in the Media Lab. If you don't know this project of Hiroshi's, it's beautiful. These, when you come in, they're, they're, they're great showmen at MIT. When you come in, there's this drinks table, um, and, and you pull the stoppers out of the bottle, and, and it plays different music. It's really delightful. Um, you don't get a drink, unfortunately, but otherwise it's delightful. And um, the idea of the bottles, it, it just, it's just nice the notion that anything could be anything, that, that, you know, that pulling a stopper out of the bottle is as valid a way of turning on music or not as any other. And it's this ambivalence of exploring this is just fascinating. And um, that's Hiroshi photographing one of those cubes I've been talking about so much. This is a nice one at um, the Media Lab where they're using projected light. Now, um, somebody did Mark or whatever was asking about mixing virtual reality and um, and different scales of time scales of interaction and so on. This is quite a nice example where you've got a real physical thing you can change, but also projected light which is changing in a different way. This is a, a good example of that. These are little bits of building, and here is something indicating the wind direction, but these and the solar, the compass direction, and the time of day, but these lines here, little arrows, which I don't know if you can see, but they are the, the predicted wind flow around these buildings. 
And these shadows, are, they're all being projected from above, are the shadows that this building would cast at that time of the day. So instead of having to move a lamp around in the lab to simulate the shadows, it's done just by working it out in the computer and then projecting it vertically. I'm, um, I think there's a lot of mileage in these hybrid environments, and, and I, I think the notion that we will see them full scale soon is really quite, is really quite fascinating, but isn't central to what I'm saying. And the other people around that part of the world, or in the case of Marcus Novak, um, who is, the reason for showing that is to remind me to say that Marcus is right over on the extreme of emergence. He's one of those people who thinks that something can emerge from nothing. And I said earlier in the week, and we'll need to repeat tomorrow, that I don't think you, I think nothing will emerge from nothing. Um, and you have to seed it. Marcos, that I think that is extremely conservative of me, and during this week I had criticism from some members of the audience on that same line, saying that, why don't I go out to a more extreme position? Um, the answer is, because if I think I go to an extreme position, nothing whatsoever will happen, and I don't want nothing whatsoever to happen. Um, however, it's an interesting question. So Marcus and I um, obviously know each other very well, but we're standing two meters apart, which is about the scale of it. And the thing behind happens to be a gate by Michael Fox from Kinetics, the MIT Kinetics group. It it's, um, has the most sensuous movement, that rusty steel gate. It's very deceptive because it looks like it's a rusty old iron fence. And you get that, it, the most beautiful electronically controlled stainless steel hydraulic rams and things controlling. This, this gate just sort of slides open and greets you. It's, it's absolutely poetic. And the reason for mentioning that is to do with the question about time scale. Again, I've been asked about how fast things might change, and we talked a little bit about minute by minute change, like flicking light switches, opening blinds, walls bending about, the sort of Cedric thing where things might move over a daily basis, things that might move over a monthly basis. And I think we must differentiate between development and evolution. I think something can develop over its lifestyle, over its lifetime, but I think that the um, evolution has to occur in discrete steps. You don't evolve during the you just develop from, from one seed through a fetus to a human being, and then you go through a huge learning process, and then you start to go into a kind of decaying stage, um, and that's change. And of course, you can change quite dramatically psychologically. However, you don't suddenly evolve into a, uh, into a hyena or a giraffe or something during a lifetime. So I think that the different kinds of change have to be kept quite separate, um, and the difference between developmental biology and evolutionary biology has to be maintained. Um, something that's got on with these, this is applying some of these techniques to, again, to the Sagrada. I showed one example yesterday of making a stone. This is, um, again, uh, where the process of making these columns is being linked to the computer process. And um, this, the person doing this work for Mark, is the person who helped me get these two machines working together, Tom here. And then we built this interactive demonstration for the uh, exhibition at, at, at Barcelona. And to, to Julian and I, the great amusement when we got there to see it, it was the only thing not working because Tom had built it rigorously enough. But it was quite nice because uh, you can actually play with and design your own Gaudis in real time. That was the idea. But it was so popular on the first day, it only lasted a day, so that was that. Anyway, they're very, very building it. It's a nice toy, it's a kind of, because it's physical. You, you physically make your own galleries in the simulation of the process down here that the mason is using to make the fluted columns. It's quite clever. Um, um, just a few slides of um, our students experimenting with um, interaction. Um, every student in the unit that year um, built one input device and one output device. So. This is pizza electric grass, this is Will's loudspeaker, there are body suits and so on. And all of them interacted uh, so that they all talk to each other, uh, making a, a, a complex total environment um, where it was unclear um, what input device was operating what output device. In this case, you see two visitors quite obviously surprised to see that this device here is responding to something that something someone has done down here. Um, and that was again just to again explore differences between the mouse, the screen, the keyboard. It's, everyone's going to laugh. It's, it's easy, it's, this is one of those moments before 
When someone has broken away from the notebook, it will be so obvious and everyone will say, well, that's pretty obvious, you know, why didn't you do that before? But right now, is it obvious to anyone in this room what's going to replace this ludicrously inappropriate concept? It's very difficult, and it's very curious historically. The minute afterwards, it's like the life game. Once you've seen the life game, it's so obvious. Once you've heard the rules, it's so obvious. Can't understand why it took John Morton Conway four years. When everyone's seen that house that Gianni did yesterday, they heard it took nine years, they can't believe it. But it wasn't obvious when he started. It wasn't obvious to any one of us how to do it, what he wanted to do. And, and I think this is a problem. And it's, it's, it's with us, and I'm trying to pitch this problem, into the, into, the, into the question of rethinking computing. I started this morning by saying that we solved the wrong problem. We've got a solution, and we didn't even know what the problem was that we thought we'd solved. But we've got it again now, even worse. We're going to have even more computing power. We can do even more things in the environment, and we still haven't even defined between us succinctly what the problem is. And that's what I'm going to have to try and do tomorrow, because I've got my, I've myself for 24 hours to solve this one. And this was, this was just mischief. Um, Tim Yakner, at the time at the AA, Jeff Kipnis was there, and they were doing folded structures. Folding was in. And, and folding was silly because they couldn't get the software to make continuous folding shapes, so they did it in strips that didn't join up properly. And um, it was taking them hours and hours to put all this stuff into the computer. So Tim, just as a joke, made this mat with these light sensors in, and as you pen the map around, so the thing moved on the screen. We didn't really intend it as an input device at all. It was just intended to wind up Jeff Kipnis. We rebuilt this model several times and, and smaller. And you wonder why. Well, um, the reason was I wanted more of them. We didn't have enough of the original cube. This is two systems talking to each other. Because I'm not interested in, let's assume this is building A and building B, that building A should be conceived and designed by this system without talking to this. So in this case, these two systems are talking are talking to each other. It took us a surprisingly long time to do this. It's another of these things that ought to have been easy, but in fact that took a long time. We're talking about roughly 10 years between, the, between starting trying to do it and actually succeeding. Uh, this is what I did want to show. This is some using that to teach computer programming. This is in order to answer that question about how to get the software and things more complicated, how to get the systems more complicated. And one way isn't just to do the buildings, but to drive the actual software. And this is being used to teach software programming. So in Hong Kong, we were trying to teach the students how to use, uh, how to write their own software. Now what's being done, each of the cubes represents, a, there's a piece of computer printout. Each of those chunks of code is related to one of these objects. And this is a bit of a joke, because this is known as object-oriented coding, and it, and it means it literally here as well as metaphorically. So this is a bad pun, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I do have point of that out, you'd never have known, didn't I? So, um, each, and so you can program, look what's happening, you can program something by sticking the cubes together. So now you have a physical way of writing physical programs, and of course it can then go into one of those evolutionary loops. So we taught all students how to do programming. So the idea is that the, the computer program becomes spatial, and it becomes physical, but also in terms of what we've been saying, it can go into one of these evolutionary systems. So this begins to be the kind of way also code can start to write itself. Um, we also used to teach all students how to make their own, you, you probably noticed that all those students in my unit, like Will and Sam and Sue Hart, could, could all do the electronics. We just took that for granted that anyone could manage to design and build a computer. It's after a trivial task. Um, but when we got to Hong Kong, we discovered how to teach it explicitly. So we used to do a hands-on way, again, you can guess. Um, and, 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 and it's kind of giveaway about me in a way that, that every time I I want to try and explain some of these complicated things. I go straight back to trying to do it physically and actually make it. Instead of trying to explain it, we made it and made it work. So the problem that year was to try to pick up these golf balls and put them in a box, make a little robot to do it, and it was competitive. And each student had to, they've collectively built, one, built a little robot, then they had to program it. And the thing is, it worked. They managed to get this thing to go around and pick all these balls up and put them in the box. It's a nightmare. They've got to find the balls, pick them up, tip them into the box, and the box mustn't move away. And um, we got all the first year students to do this kind of thing, these kind of games regularly. And then we discovered the horror of somebody in the engineering department because they tried to get their students to do it and failed. Some of them joined that. 
I just want to make one last point before I do, which is about phenotypes, and this is the last point. Um, the gene makes gel gel uh, the, the gene, the genotypic information, makes phenotypes or phenotypes, depending on how you like to pronounce it. The problem is that that a shell like that isn't technically a phenotype because it's not part of the snail. However, every snail of that species has a characteristic, and you would immediately spot that kind of characteristic design of shell. Depending, so therefore it must be, it must be genetic. It must be being, the shape and color must be being generated genetically. It's made, of course, though, of silicon and bits of sand from the base of the river or the sea. They also, different variation species of this, have different color patterns depending on where they, what the river sand is like, which you might say is obvious, because obviously if you pick up different redder sand, it's going to make a redder shell, yes, but it still makes these patterns wherever it is. It seeks out, obviously, some white sand, and how it does that isn't clear either, and, and, and makes this design. So all the instructions of that must be inside the, the genetic information of the snail, because nobody taught it to do that. So this is called an extended phenotype. So one of Dawkins' most interesting books is simply called The Extended Phenotype, which is entirely about this problem. Because the next part of the extension is, well, what about birds' nests? They're genetically programmed. What about beaver dams? They're genetically, but they're buildings. So what about buildings? Why, why, why don't we talk about buildings as being extended phenotypes? Well, the biologist's answer to that is because it's mainly learnt behaviour therefore it's, it's learnt. The genes may drive us to want to make shelter, the genes may drive us to be learning machines and making machines, but in the end the urge to the, the actual form of the building has come from the, the learnt skills. You have to learn really hard to make a space as unpleasant as this. Um, so, there's another extension to this idea, which is why, is, why not regard the computer as an extended phenotype? And there's somebody, and I'm struggling to find the name, so if anyone in the audience knows the answer to this, please tell me, which is who is it who says that the only reason that nature evolved man was because nature knew it was running out of time and couldn't change quickly enough. And we'll come back to this issue about the rate of change of time in nature. So it evolved man, so man would evolve computers, so computers would fix the evolutionary problem. Now this is a very interesting line of thought, and is much more subtle than it at first sounds. Um, and I will return to that question tomorrow, but I want to just say one, this last remark, which is on the screen, which is, I've been started the lecture by saying that I didn't think computers are much use for drafting or rendering or anything like that. That was all pretty dumb and not very interesting. Um, but what I think it does allow us to do is to change these scales, as with the life game, to you can run them very fast, so you can do temporal compression of space, or you can look at very, very large arrays of them, so you can do spatial compression of, of time. Sorry, and um, and that it seems to me is its primary function in order to accelerate the exploration and evaluation of mu multiple possible future trajectories. So the kind of question I'm setting myself tomorrow is, first of all, I've got to convince you that that's, that's a valid proposition, and I've got to try and demonstrate why that would be useful and, and how. Um, so tomorrow will consist first of a very, very quick um, re recap of some of the points I've made just for five minutes or so. Then I'm going to deal with the environment because the environment also I think has a view on all this, um, including the possibility that it evolved us just simply so that we could fix its speed problem and I must talk more about the speed problem. And then the storyteller, it's in the plural, it's not a typo because there are two of us, the other is Sam. And it, uh, Sam was the angel at the beginning of the week. This one is, um, is of course, Pasolini um, playing the storyteller, playing Chaucer, and the storyteller has somehow got to pull this, pull this story together. So I'd rather not take any questions today because I've got rather a lot to do in order to, to get this together in the next 24 hours. So unless there are any burning questions, um, I'd like to stop now and hope to see some of you again tomorrow. Thank you.